I couldn't really even begin to tell you how many crimes I've committed. I was once described as a walking crime wave. I was uh, quite chuffed by that. I've always drunk. I used to love a drink, even as a kid. It was a way of life. Um, I started taking drugs when I was 10. So uh, all of a sudden I looked around and I was sticking needles in me. So I was an heroin addict. I'd stayed in a squat over East London, which I'll describe it to you. It was human waste all over the floor, syringes and empty beer cans everywhere, blood squirted up the wall from the syringes. My bed was an old mattress that we'd found in the dustbin and my blankets were the clothes I slept in. I stunk to high heaven. That's how I lived. All this time I was taking other drugs, drinking copious amounts of alcohol, committing crime on a daily basis, sometimes on a multi-daily basis, 10 times a day crimes. It depended on how much you earn. It's about five o'clock. I'm in my office, which is in the, the first floor and it's time to go to the gym. I go upstairs and as I walk up to the top landing, I push open the door and there's a man that I'd never seen before. He says, what are you doing? It's my house, what are you doing in here? And I'll give him some old flannel. I said, oh, I live over the road at number two and I'll see someone acting suspiciously and I heard a funny noise. And I said, um, where's number two? I said, over there. But unfortunately, it was over there. And so he knew I was telling lies and he knew I was a burglar. He unfortunately ran into uh, a kitchenette that we have on the, on, the, on the top floor and shouted knife. And so I thought, oh God, now we're in real trouble. And I had this guy after me and I didn't get a knife. I, I got the top of the oven, the heavy old thing, cast iron, and I put it, smashed him over there behind me. Which hurt, but again, I'm, 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 I'm pumping, so it, you know, I don't hear, feel it very much. He stumbled and we fought, and as we fought, we rolled down a flight of stairs, proper John Wayne stuff going on there, and uh, there was a big old flower pot, and I picked it up and smashed him straight over the head with that. And I remember the blood coming out of his head. And I kept going, and we bundled and fought, and bundled and fought, and I got him outside the door, and I said, you know, help me, help me. And I, you know, it just looked like two middle-aged men having a ding-dong. And then the police car came, so obviously someone had called the police. The police pull up and I nicked in the back of the van. They said to me, uh, you know, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm fine. So they said, uh, well, you're bleeding. And as I put my hand behind my head, I've got my whole head is just saturated in blood. I'm not about to sit there um, feeling remorseful and sorry. It was just a bad day at the office for me, so I'm off to prison and, oh well, can't wait to get to prison because get to prison, that means I can get some drugs. My wife came to collect me in, in, the, in the hospital and as I put the key in the door, I suddenly had a fear that there would be somebody at the other side of the door. And it happened day after day after day after day. And it's not a, it's not a very nice feeling. In fact, it's a really, it's a, you know, you, 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 you feel scared. So about two or three weeks later, a police officer called me and he said that, you know, we're conducting a study on, on a thing called restorative justice where the offender meets the victim. And would you be interested in taking part? If I'm honest, part of me sort of wanted to say sorry to this fellow, but the majority of me only wanted to do the restorative justice conference to get out of cell for an hour. Suddenly this day came and the screw the prison officer opened my door, it was a lunchtime, and he said, come on then. I'm walking along this passageway. Whether or not it's true, I don't know, but apparently the screws used to say, this was where the condemned man used to go. And at that very moment, I started to feel like a condemned man. I'm thinking, I don't really want to do this. I don't want to go and meet the victims of my crimes. I don't want to meet anyone. I just want to go and lay in my bed. And we get up to the door and I'm thinking, ah, oh, I don't want to be here, I just don't want to be here. Just as I went to say it, the door opened. And there is a guy I fought about two months earlier and he's in a sort of prison garb and looking really sheepish. And, you know, I'm beginning to think, you know, what the hell are we doing here? But anyway, it's going to happen. Whatever it is, it's going to happen. So here we go. So I started going on 
about the poor old me's and how I've had an hard life and giving all the social spill, because all my life that's what I've done, give social spill to probation officers and social workers. I thought I had everyone eating out the palm of my hands. He's just going through the movements, just going through the same old lines, the same old tripe, and uh, I'm, I'm beginning to get very, very annoyed, very, very annoyed. And it came to a point, and I said to Will, Will, when we first met. And that's it. And I just lose it completely. And he started listing all the things that I've done. And he also started listing his feelings. And it comes out like a fire hydrant. You know, and I said to him, I said, you know, we didn't meet in some bloody cocktail bar in Islington. You broke into my house. You destroy my one belief that I had, which is my ability to protect my family, my house, from people like you, and you did it in one fell swoop. I never knew it made people feel that sad, angry, bad, depressed, isolated, guilty, guilty about things I'd done, yeah? I didn't know. P Peter was just, I mean, it was like a train hitting him. You could see that he, he said, God, you know, I've done this. It was like a flow of emotion started coming out, and I never realised it. I just never realised the damage I'd done. I never realised the harms I've caused. I never realised how many people it affected. And he was a man who wasn't showing remorse because of the, the lawyer had said, you've got to show remorse, you get time off. He was a man who was genuinely, genuinely affected by what we had said. And we start conversing, we start talking, and Peter starts talking. He starts talking from his heart, from his, from his real core of his existence. When you hear the damage, what you have done, when you hear the harm you've caused, you've got to be a very, very bitter and twisted human being if this doesn't affect you. You've got to be, you've got to be a sicko. I was fully expecting these people who I've done a lot of harm to to say, lock him up. Give him the birch, throw away the key, we don't care. But I was quite amazed. So I went back to that cell and sat there with all these feelings, you know. And I sat with them for a long time trying to work them out and separate them. And... You can't just leave him there. You've got to help him help himself. So therefore we then went out and said, listen, we want to see you change. We want to see you get yourself together. We want to help you in this process. We'd like to see him address his alcohol and addiction problems. We'd like to see him address his offending problems. We'd like to see him maybe get some education. And we'd like to see him even get a job when he gets out. In a court of law, the victim sits in the public gallery. He, she, family, his loved ones, are the most affected by this crime and then the least involved in the process. They don't get no input into it and there's questions that need answering and they can't possibly answer these questions unless they meet the harmer, the wrongdoer, the, the villain of the piece, the criminal. And that's all this is, is bringing people around, well it happened to be a prison table, but I mean it could be anywhere and having them saying, well, why, why did you do that? You know, do, you know, do you understand what, how that affected me? Do you understand how that affects other people? Ever since we first met, we continue to meet. Uh, we have become, uh, both of us, utter converts to restorative justice, to restorative approaches, to bringing offenders and, and victims together. Because of that conference, it initiated change, it implemented change, I implemented the change, but it sort of gave me the kickstart I needed. You know, I can't express gratitude enough for the restorative justice programme, and I've got to leave it there for a minute.